Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank uh, you. I'm Ann Vanderbay. I'm a technology editor at Bloomberg News. Um, we have a really stellar panel today talking about innovation and collaboration. This is Prakash Koda, CIO of Autodesk. This is Harry Mosley, CIO of Zoom. This is Sri Lakshmi Kohli, CIO of Align Technology. And this is Dave McJanet, CEO of HashiCorp. Sorry, HashiCorp, sorry. So I'd like to start off with a pretty basic question, and that is just why bother? You know, why is innovation important? The stakes are high, the risks are large. Um, why, take the, why take the jump? What, sorry, what's the question? Why take the job as a CIO? <laughs> <laughs> that, that too. But why innovate? You know, why make big changes if at a large corporation it's a pretty big risk? I would put it as why not innovate? Being in Silicon Valley is the best place to innovate. And if you don't, somebody else will do and then disrupt you. So, and um, I would say it's more about consumerization. Every business and every user and customer is becoming like a consumer mentality. If you look at the life at home, it is so drastically changed in the last five to seven years. And when they come to work, it is typically the same kind of business process, tools that they go through. So they are looking for change. And right now is an awesome time to really invest and partner with several startups, whatever are there, and innovate within your company to give that experience. It's all about experience. It's not about technology, I would say. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> my opinion, it's all about innovation, um, the art of the possible. When we think about what we can do today, um, you know, we dreamt about those uh, possibilities, call it 12 or 24 months ago. I mean, the notion that you can get on a plane now, uh, just using facial recognition as an example, I mean, if you had talked about that 24 months ago, you'd say, I, that's never going to happen. But you can do that now. Um, the notion that drones in the UK are going out looking for potholes is my favorite one looking for potholes and then sending signals to other drones to come out and patch the pothole. I mean, I think that's pretty fascinating. Um, I just hope they never try that in New York City. But, um, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, digital technologies are impacting all of us at every level, you know, whether it's individuals, businesses, and uh, we want to be at the forefront of that disruption. So in our case, for example, uh, we would like to be the leaders in the evolution of digital dentistry. So we build digital orthodontic systems, you know, whether it's the Invisalign Clear Aligner or the uh, digital intraoral scanner, which is iTero. And that enables um, us to also bring great experiences to doctors, patients, and, you know, like transform the whole industry. So it's very important that uh, we are able to innovate and bring all of this disruption and digital technology to life. So I, I'm, I'm the lone vendor here on the, on the panel, so maybe a slightly different perspective. Obviously, living where we do, we, uh, it's sort of obvious to us how fast the world is changing and how all modes of, of business, frankly, are changing um, and how dangerous that is to most organizations who have spent 30 or 40 or 100 years developing defensive moats around supply chain, around manufacturing, or whatever it might be, uh, and all of a sudden uh, a very, very small company can go direct to consumer and take your customers away from you. And all the investments you've made over the last 50 years are sort of obviated by that reality. So if you're not attuned to that, uh, it's a very genuine business risk. And even you know, think of companies like GE, which are struggling with this, this sort of thing. Uh, it's very, very real. So. I don't think it's a choice. I think those of us who get in this ecosystem are so fixated on the velocity of it that it's not surprising to us. But if you're, if you're outside of it, I think maybe it's not as obvious how dangerous it is. Right. Yeah, just to, add, just yeah. to add another point, it's like we were chatting outside before about sort of um, innovation and startups. And you know, the ability to be able to start up a company today, you, know, you can do it in the basement of your house with a credit card and bingo. It's kind of like you can hire a couple of people. Um, you can use LinkedIn to source them. Um, you can bring them online. Amazon, AWS, or Azure, or choose your cloud provider, um, and off you go. I mean, I did a startup back in 1981, and uh, I remember having to buy a mini computer for $100,000. That was 1981, can you imagine? And you know, five-year leases, today you go to WeWork, and like, you're up and running in hours. Yeah, and the other thing is like uh, all the consumers 
are so used to change. So previously, it's, there's no lifetime. Yes. It's like once you buy, it's not like, oh, I'm married to this tool or this process or this company forever. That's not. As, long, as soon as they get a new, better value for what they're giving, uh, uh, cost or whatever they're paying, they immediately hop onto it. So if you don't innovate, you'll become irrelevant. So yeah. you cannot and, just... And, and that's not just the consumer, Prakash. That's in the enterprise. Completely, too. yeah. Because the enterprise model has changed, changed a lot, right? Over the last 10 years, it was all on-prem. Now it's all off-prem. If you look at sort of Zoom as a company, we have no on-prem tech. Completely agree. It's all in the cloud. Um, and, you know, we don't like this service today. We can switch to some other service tomorrow. What's the cost of that transition? Yeah. Not a lot relative to what it used to be. And you know, the, the yeah. shelf life of technology is also uh, changing so fast that what we used to think technical debt was five years ago is like, you're already in five years, you know, we just did a big transformation program, in three years you're already out of sync. So just to keep up with the pace of uh, the product, great products and services that we want to introduce to the market, we have to, we have to keep innovating. Right. Yeah. Dave, what do you think? What is the difference between working with a really active CIO and one who's kind of sitting back, more complacent, maybe not trying as hard? To <laughs> um, I, there are probably a couple of things that come to mind when you think about the, the vendor relationship. Uh, this is, just for what it's worth, I've done several companies, and, and I really like the vendor relationship. I think uh, point number one from folks is recognizing that vendors want to be enablers. That's what we do in the B2B sense. Our, our, our mission is to be an enabler for people to spend money uh, so that over the time we can partner with them over long periods of time. Uh, so that's sort of a foundational recognition. We're not trying to sell you a product. We actually want to play a role in the value chain that, that, that is important to you. Number two, we make bets. We make bets as to where the market's going. Uh, and sometimes we're wrong, but a lot of times we're right because we are actually in the information flow. Uh, that allows us to predict probably well ahead of where most folks can see because they're not as fixated on this particular piece uh, where the market's going to go. And there's a very high likelihood that that's going to be relevant to CIOs in two or three years because that's just the game that we play. That's the way the capitalism works. So what, what works for us best is when we partner with companies that recognize the role of the vendor. Uh, we're not just trying to sell something. We actually generally want to, you know, we've made a bet that says we think the market's going to go from this thing to this thing and we can play a role in enabling it. Um, so it's really the recognition of, 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 that, of, the, of the relationship as much as anything. And then lastly, obviously, once these things start to become real, uh, we, have, we as a vendor have a very unique perspective on what works and what doesn't. And what we hear from a lot of people is, don't let us screw this up. Uh, and I think that's a big part of it, is recognize that that vendor, you may have a trusted SI, you may have a trusted partner that, that you do implementation work with, but recognize that the vendors just see these patterns all day, every day. And so if you're, like in our case, if you're going cloud, I know what the blueprint looks like, because we talk to 200 people a week. Uh, and I think those are the three things probably. It's a stress with the recognition of what it is we're trying to do. Uh, and, you know, it's a long-term trust-based relationship. What do you guys think about the vendor relationship versus uh you know, asking vendors to bring in innovation versus kind of doing it from the top down, doing it from the CIO's office specifically? I would say it's a combination, right? Uh, when you have some capabilities, first of all, you are innovating because you're trying to add value to your customer base continuously, and you're also trying to see what problem you're trying to solve. So, and whether it is in-house, in some cases you may build it. If it is the core IP of what you're trying to do, it's a product, you'll try to build it. But if it's not, if you can augment through a vendor solution and then enable it quickly so that you can solve and add more value, why not partner? So it's all case by case. It's not like a definition that for everything we'll go out and buy or we'll build everything. It's a combination. But more and more appetite has come. And, and being in a software company, the immediate reaction is, oh, why can't we build it? But the mindset is changing. It's like, who can we partner with? Why should we build it? If that's not our core, who can we partner with and enable quickly so that we get the value? How many startups do you work with now? Close to 20. Wow. Just and in there your are office. <laughs> yes. Wow. And there are a couple of them in this crowd, too. I, I mean, Zoom last year, they're no more a startup. They went uh, public. Yeah. But when uh, they Eric, are, Eric, just for the record, Eric still thinks of us like a startup. <laughs> he does. He does. <laughs> uh, but we, we leveraged them last year, quick divesting of uh, six different collaboration platforms into one really seamless. I can see, I see their use to move works who just came out of stealth. 
we leverage them from idea stage to implementing their AI based bot solution 75 days and quickly getting value to our entire employee base is phenomenal. So it's not like you're talking that for months or quarters, you're talking about it from idea to implementation 75 day cycle. Right. And I think Prakash you know, sort of used a word there which I think is super important. It's about partnerships, it's not about vendors. It's like, right. you know, vendors are sort of um, uh, organizations that are transient in my mind. And so they're temporary in nature, and that relationship is therefore temporary. So please don't take it the wrong way. Well, I, I, was, actually, I was actually intending to say the same thing, but I, it's, I, it's, always about, it's always about the partnership. Yeah. And whether, you know, when I was at KPMG or Blackstone and I was buying services, I was buying services from companies that I wanted a partnership with. And, okay. and, and we at Zoom think of our clients as partners. It's all about the success of that organization. <coughs> You know, um, to add to both of them, I think if you had the right technology, meaning you trusted that there is a right partner who's placing the right bet where the technology is going, then you sort of start working with them very early on, especially in the Valley. There is a very rich ecosystem of um, startup companies. And New York's right behind you. New York, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so if, if you trusted that the technology is in the right direction and the company uh, is moving ahead, then they can actually truly help us innovate from the outside yeah. and accelerate some of how we build great products and services for our own customers. Um, and that is something that should be front and center of every CIO uh, every week, is to look at what is the ecosystem of uh, companies, ecosystem of technologies that are available, um, who's, where there's a good cultural fit and who can help us get to the next level faster. Right. I actually, I want to talk a little bit more. You recently overtook, undertook a, a big overhaul of the processes at your company. Um, what was your approach? Um, so, like I said, I mean, so for us it was like, I mean, we are about 20 plus years, so um, the technology stack was getting stale, and for the pace of rapid global growth that we had in front of us, the difference of the local go-to-market conditions, the uh, medical um, regulations around privacy, um, all of that meant that we needed to create a technology architecture that allowed us to scale globally, but also have local go-to-market control. So I have local IT teams, local commercial teams that are continuing to work on go-to-market processes that are as fast and uh, meet the needs of the local market that I don't have to control it from global here. And so our job is to figure out how do I create that platform? How do I create the technology infrastructure? So part of it was we moved all of the uh, customer facing and the patient facing applications to the cloud. We consolidated all of the enterprise infrastructure into uh, simple processes that allowed the agility to, um, that they could also go on sprints. You know, if I ever went and said, oh, the ERP team is sprinting, they would look at us like, what's going on? But there was a good infusion of culture, uh, all the way from customer-facing applications to back-end enterprise. And then uh, we also had a chance to re redo our whole data model, um, how do we provide data as a service to the company. Uh, and, uh, and I think all of that translates into how well we can actually deliver digital products to our customers. So one of the interesting things is that it sounds like the role of a CIO is kind of working on the way the entire company works rather than just IT or something very specific. Um, how do you think the role has changed? I think, I, previously it used to be like IT and business. Now IT is part of business. So you're truly enabling uh, all of your peer organizations to be really successful. How can we make them effective and productive? And how can we understand what is most important for them? And how do we remove friction? It's all about experience, whether you look at our customers, partners, or employees. What is that that is important to them, and how can we remove friction from a business process standpoint? And that's where I think uh, IT leaders and technology leaders are making a huge impact, because with the partners that are available, the quick collaboration and quick wins that you can bring to the table, that gives a lot of confidence and trust to entire ecosystem, whether it's your end customers, your internal employees, there is immediate confidence that builds out when you start seeing value in a very quick iterations. 
Because previously it used to be like when you talk to IT, it takes nine months or 18 months. There's no more programs like that. You're talking about two week sprints or three week sprints to get some minimum viable product out there. So they know that we are also adapting to the pace at which we want to move as a business. And that is really making a change. So there used to be a struggle. And I remember those days when like, oh, we need a seat at the table. Now we are part of the table. Like we're making those decisions and helping influence some of these key decisions so that business can progress. So I think it's a unique time to be in the business of IT or a CIO to be leading and enabling your peers. Yeah, I should fully agree with that. It's like we are <coughs> at the epicenter of the company and we have a full 360 view of what's going on in the company, whether it's the internal ERP systems or the HR systems or the CRM systems, billing systems, etc., but also the technology. One of the stories I'd love to tell is um, I remember when I was at KPMG and I got an email from one of my partners at 10 o'clock on a Wednesday night which read something like the following. Harry, we're going into this very large client in three weeks with a digital presentation. So we're doing a, a pitch to do their digital transformation and we're going in with PowerPoint and printed books like we normally do. And so we you know, got a group of people together in the morning because as IT leaders, we know the art of the possible, and uh, got a whole group of people together, and they went in with iPads, digital presentation, all video, all, all through the, uh, the glass, so to speak, and it was a phenomenal um, outcome, so. You just recycled all the books, just <laughs> push them off the table. There was, no, there was no paper in the room, it was fantastic. I kind of go back to the, uh, I think the Gartner model is right there, systems of record and systems of engagement. And uh, the pressure is on how do you build new systems of engagement to engage your customers, your employees. And so it, from the outside, that's a lot of what I think has happened is that percentage of energy that's being spent on that is just, that is the job from what I can tell. It's how do you build these ways to interact with your customers so that other people don't. Uh, and that, that to me seems like a big part of the role. It's a continuous engagement. Like we did recently, last year we initiated this. There's no ticketing system if you come to Autodesk. It's hidden because that's the first thing I wanted out because I didn't want people interacting with me. Hey, no, your IT team is not responding to this ticket. Yeah. I'm like, okay, there's no more ticketing system. There is this. <laughs> the <self> <laughs> there's nothing to complain about anymore. <laughs> I really don't. There's that's no the ticket ticket anymore. <laughs> exactly. So we built a platform and the ticketing system sits underneath that. So we are hiding the complexity because we really want to track what happens, but it is all about self-service and we call it Help Hub. You come in there, we know what your persona is, like you're a sales user or you're a finance user, what kind of access do you need to have? You come and activate your access. And we'll also tell you, your peer is using this tool and based on your persona, you should be using it. Do you need any help in using? So because we want to increase adoption. And so gone are those days, you submit these 100 forms and when an employee joins, it takes three to four months for them to first figure out what all tools do I need to act, have, ask for access? And then who all do I need to chase to get access so that they can start getting productive? Now we're talking about birthrights. When you come on the first day, when you get access, how can you start getting productive? So that's the mode we are looking at because that's how we're going to retain talent. Because the digital native generation that is coming into workforce, they are like, they're expecting, they don't know that how companies or corporate used to work. All they're used to is they're born with iPads. And so they don't know what form you're talking about. I clicked and I, I, I want access on my own demand. And that's the nature of what we are seeing. But those things are possible now. So it's, when you decided to get rid of tickets, were people like, oh yeah, great, let's do that? Uh, was it a struggle? It was not a struggle. Uh, because one, if they cannot get anything on the portal, there is a chat bot that you can chat. And if it doesn't answer in the two clicks, it hands over you to a real agent that can solve. My goal is, if you need something now, how do I help you now? Not ask you to open a ticket and tell, we'll get back to you in eight hours. And then I get dashboard saying that we met SLA. And, but the user is so frustrated because they didn't get one, they needed it. So it was not, and again, this is not something that I went to users and told we're going to get rid of it. It's just a decision I took and the team implemented and the users are super happy. It's fascinating to think how things used to be. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that long ago, right? It is not. <laughs> so how important is it to bring in other people in the company? Because that sounds like a pretty big change. Um, Sri, you've talked about when you were undergoing the transformation at Align Technology, you 
worked really closely with the CEO, CMO, other C-level people. Yeah. Um, it, it is, so when we talk about digital transformation as a whole, um, it's very important that everybody is engaged, right? Like I don't think one particular group alone can champion it. It's also the reason why big programs fail and no one does big programs these days and it's all, if you're, if you're going truly agile and your technology is modular enough, then you create small self-empowered teams to go figure out what's the right thing, what business outcomes do you want, how quickly can I release it and learn from it and experiment and iterate. Um, and so in that model, the teams are all together. It's like you can figure out who's IT, who's marketing, who's sales, who's uh, manufacturing. And uh, then the good thing about it is the decision making and is all within the teams and the teams feel accountable to the outcome that they have to deliver in that product or the service that they're offering. So I actually think that the power of today's digital technologies actually brings everyone together to deliver that great product or service to the customers. I think she touched on a good point. Culture is very important. The How you operate within the company and the top-down support, because your teams start behaving based on how the leaders operate. And if you have complete alignment at C-level leadership and CEO staff, you will start seeing incredible things happening at team level. They really see that the leaders work together very well and they're so aligned then they figure out and you really empower them so that they make decisions. If the CEO staff are not aligned, then you start seeing that kind of very wrong behaviors at the team level and things take forever. And that's something I would say we're proud at Autodesk. We have significant culture and values that we really push on that make a huge difference at the speed and velocity that which we are able to deliver. And there's, two, and there's, there's two other things I'd just like to add on um, to both of what you, you guys just said. Um, so one is the technology literacy. Mm -hmm. So the technology literacy of the people that are being employed in, in all our companies, organizations today is dramatically more than what it was three, four, five years ago. You know, I, I remember uh, talking to the professor of applied science and engineering at uh, WashU um, in St. Louis, and he was saying, how more and more of the students that are going through the computer science and engineering program, um, whilst their you know their majors are in something else, they're also taking engineering classes. They're learning how to code. They're learning about data visualizations. And in addition to that, the role of us as CIOs is is changing too, because it's less about building the solution. It's more about implementing the platform that these technically literate professionals can come in now right. and configure and use to their advantage because they know what they want. Yeah. We don't, but we have to enable them. Mm -hmm. And the last point I'd like to make is <coughs> um, two thirds of the world's population are now millennials and Gen Z. Five billion people, which is staggering. This is a group of people that grew up on glass, a group of people that grew up in the world of the internet, a group of people that live on social media, whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram or WhatsApp, etc., they don't even know how to talk to each other anymore on a device. They only know how to, you know, sort of, I'll say to my 21-year-old... They're very good know. at texting. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's, I, this is exactly the point. I, I'm with, you know, I was having dinner with my younger son in St. Louis at this one. I said, when was the last time you chatted with Sammy, his eldest brother, his older brother, only brother, 23, lives in Zurich? He said, yesterday. I said, that's great. When was the last time you connected with him? About three weeks ago. And the difference there is, chatted was he was, you know, <laughs> sending a message and getting messages back. Connected was, you know, uh, in my case, they were connecting on Zoom, obviously. Um, but, wow, you know, what a month. <laughs> <laughs> but they were connecting because they wanted to see each other and talk to each other, and they were sharing photos of visits and things that they had done together. And, and that's... That's that's, that's, that, and we're employing these people, and they, want to, and they want to come into our great organizations, and they want to come in and behave like that and work like that now. And they want to be able to connect to people locally, nationally, locally, locally, nationally, and globally in an instant. And the connect is the key word here. I don't want to hear you, I want to see you, because when I see you, I can read your facial expression, and I can see you nodding, therefore I know you agree, so I should shut up. Well, I was going to say, we, so we, uh, 
just to give a sense for we have we have about 550 employees give or take and all of our engineering is distributed so nobody's in the same place so we've kind of gone to the extreme of saying we're just going to embrace that reality and say that this is it, there's no reason innovation doesn't happen remotely uh, and, and we're going to prove it uh, because that particular generation that's that is what they want yeah, so it's not a remote workforce anymore it's a distributed yeah it's workforce. distributed it's distributed because remote is like it's a, it makes you and feel you know, bad yeah and you know like um, so one, of the, one of the biggest advantages that I see when you know in a good distributed workforce is that we cannot sit here and possibly imagine what customers in China or Brazil or Europe want and so when you have a distributed workforce they are thinking local markets and they're able to bring that diversity of thought and, on, and culture into, into the teams that build these products and there is a huge advantage to it. I mean, in the past, we could, we could all say that we were all centrally located in one place and we'd be doing customer feedback sessions you know, once in six months and the feedback was already too late by the time you built the features out. And, and I actually like the concept of a distributed workforce because it gets us closer to the customers and, and gives us almost instantaneous feedback. So I want to talk about when collaboration doesn't work so well. Dave, you talked about sometimes CIO can have a great idea, they want to do this big project, and not everyone in the company is aligned. Maybe the legal team thinks that it's too risky. What do you think yeah. that the biggest pitfalls are, the biggest risks are? Yeah, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, it's been interesting to us the, how difficult it is to work with some large companies. Uh, it's not surprising that uh, things, yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example. So the, pro the products that we build start as open source, and I'm guessing most people use them already. And yet we'll go knock on a door and someone inside the organization says, oh yeah, we need to have become a partner with you and sign a commercial contract, and the legal team says no. Uh, they have to take unlimited indemnification before we can work with them. And we just go, okay, we're going to work with someone else then. Uh, and it's surprising how much of a barrier that is, because the reality is you're already running those products in production, unsupported. <laughs> so we can argue about the legal people that want to say, no, no, this has to be uh, done the way we've always done procurement in the, in the past. It's just not the way it works anymore. I think the, the, just as sort of as a segue, the surprising thing is the internet has allowed us all to discover products. So it used to be that IBM would knock on your door and sell you something. Now your users are discovering something and bringing it in. And that is actually pretty, pretty disruptive uh, process-wise to how you, you know, think about innovation. But that is happening. Uh, without the, the sponsorship to force it through, I mean, we have companies that will take literally 15 months to do a contract with us after they decided to buy something from us. Their peers and competitors are well completed to your 75-day comment yeah. <laughs> and, and happily out innovating you uh, while we argue with your legal team. But that's just the, that's the reality. We get it. But I think um, it's not always obvious at the CIO level that that's happening. Yeah, I, think there's, think? I think there's two sets of CIOs in the world today. <laughs> I think there's a group of CIOs who are you know, interested in change, willing to, take a, you know, willing to experiment, not a, not a serious risk. risk. Uh, I don't think it, 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 only take a risk. It's fine, yeah, yeah. Um, and are you know not satisfied with the status quo, and um, and they're willing to sort of adopt new things and try things out, etc. And then there's a group of CIOs who are very happy with the status quo and don't want to disrupt anything um, because of the fear of risk or the fear. That, and I say that their their biggest fear is that they are going to get run over by by their business or get run over by their successor because that's just not on anymore. I guess my, sorry, my point is there, there is risk doing this, there's no question, uh, but there's risk in not doing it too. Yeah, so the key Bigger thing is risk. right, the way I would classify it is, is more about what business problem are we trying to solve as long as and what value are we going to get for the risk that we're going to take, right? It's that <laughs> business discussion we need to have, it's not about a technology discussion. If I bring it in, is there a more risk that we are adding? But what are we trying to solve? As long as CIO can sponsor that through that lens of what value, there's always risk in things that we're doing. But it's all about for what. So that's a, it's a simple question that I keep asking any vendor. So what, who cares? You may be super great, good for you, but so what? Mm -hmm. You need to articulate what is value from the business lens of where I am sitting so that we can represent to bring anything in. 
I think that's the critical thing that I always tell vendors to come in. Don't tell all the fluff stuff about yourself. You may be great, but that doesn't interest me because I talk to 20, 30 people every week. So you need to talk through my lens in solving my real business problems so that I get attention and then we can solve the real things. Right. Sri, you had an interesting approach that we talked a little bit about where instead of unveiling a new project all at once, you had a more incremental uh, approach to it? So, so part of the transformation, and I think this is where the digital technologies are actually really good in enabling this change, is, uh, is how you, you transition like you do you're delivering products and services. And if you just took a product approach to how you deliver software or deliver services, then you're looking at um, how do I create buckets of stories that have enough value that you can release to the market, experiment, learn from it, and the teams are self-motivated or self-empowered to, um, to keep changing until adoption increases. I think it's no longer a big waterfall, um, even six months is too long. So it's like a week or two weeks and it's the product mindset that you bring in and it's continual delivery of products and I don't think there is ever an end state. You know, when you, when you take a project view, then you know, there's always a finite start and end, but I think that part of it is over. Like I, the, the new, uh, way of, you know, when we, when we say digital is a mindset, then you use all of these technologies to deliver the services incrementally and you learn from it and, and that delivers great stuff at the end. So before we wrap up, I want to ask, what do you guys think is the next big thing? Is it AI? Is AI overhyped? Is it something else? What, um, you know, is the next big innovation that CIOs are thinking about so or should be thinking about? So I'd like to go first on this because Prakash is taking all the stories out. <laughs> um, no, all joking aside. Uh, so yeah, so we've got AI, you've got machine learning, you've got NLP, we've got. I, I, so there's a, a term I had an interesting chat with with a couple of people recently, which is the notion of machine thinking, which is very different to quote machine learning. This is where you know more data as, as more data comes in, the machine is thinking about well, what do I do now as a consequence yeah. of this new information that just came about? What instructions shall I give to people? What shall I share with people? What, how shall I guide people? What do I do now as I as I know more and more information? So I think that's a very different model. It's kind of hard to get your head around the machine thinking about things, but it's like we're humans, right? As humans, we get more and more information every day, whether it's something to do with mm -hmm. us personally, something you want to do with your home, something you want to do with it from a career perspective. And we will take that information and, and we will think about it. We don't, act, we don't necessarily act on it always instantaneously. And then we get new information that makes us think more about it and then we'll act. So I think, there's a, uh, I think that's something that could be kind of interesting in the future. At least that's my opinion. Thinking. No, I would say that he, he's right on, but the key thing in that is the data. There has been a huge focus on understanding your data, like your customer data or your employee data, whatever it is, because that is going to be your currency. Because all the magic of whether you're uh, uh, AI, ML, machine thinking, all that you can do once you have the data and you understand, and there is a continuous engagement you will start having with your customers once you know more about them, and customers are looking for that. That's the experience they're looking for that. Like they're saying, you tell me, what am I doing? A lot of our enterprise customers ask me the one common question, they're, okay, you give me data. And I ask this to all the vendors that give me, okay, give me the user data, like what is my usage in my enterprise? And sometimes people struggle to get that data. As long as we understand how our customers are using and really help them, then there'll be a lot more adoption and we'll, we'll also be able to deliver more capabilities and value to our customer base. So ultimately, I would say a huge focus on data, and it's a very tough problem to solve, uh, especially for people who have legacy and a lot of legacy of enterprise systems. It's data is everywhere. And with privacy laws and other things, it takes a huge uh, focus for us to get there. But one who has data in the next five years is going to really take a huge advantage and the next thing is, if you don't have data, you'll be disrupted. I mean, so, so for, for us, it is like, you know, the, the pace of technology change is like so fast 
I didn't, like he said, like, you know, machine learning is now machine thinking at some point. Um, I, a part of what, um, as a team, we all work through is, is just, like, keep the basics clean. You know, there's the data integrity exists. Um, the, art, the technical debt is low, so you're cleaning up the technical debt as you're introducing new cutting-edge technologies. Um, you want to be working with the right partners to bring in and accelerate innovation. Uh, but that also means that you need to keep your architecture stack, like really modular, uh, good enough to plug and play, that as new technologies come in, you can continue to experiment in different areas of the business while continuing to grow at such a rapid scale for us. Yeah, to me, it feels like an infrastructure thing. Actually, I kind of agree with the way you described it, is we're going through this sort of generational shift of running infrastructure in one way to running infrastructure in a new way, whether that's at the data layer, which we used to store in a SQL database or an Oracle database, and now we store in huge you know, reservoirs. Uh, that kind of that shift to, to cloud, mostly, in my opinion, it's, sort of, it's, a, it's a conceptual shift that, if you think about it as a new way of running infrastructure, enables all these things. The separation of compute and data Okay, well now I can build really interesting applications because I have infinite compute capacity on cloud and I can throw whatever data I want at it, whether that's for machine learning or thinking or whether that's for building some kind of new system of engagement. So it feels to me that is probably the big thing in my mind what's happening now is people are sort of making the shift to let me modularize my infrastructure, create the platform, and then as the cloud providers continue to innovate, they add things like this that you can just take advantage of. And that's going to breed a whole host of new uh, applications that, that people can use to differentiate. Does every, is every company in a position to amass enough data to, to be competitive here? Well, no choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're a subscription company especially, you need to have, uh, you need Got to understand it. your customer. You need to be obsessed about your customer. You need to know and for that you need to have the data. Yeah. I think not, everyone, everyone has lots of data. data exactly. I'll be surprised if someone says we have no data. <laughs> I think what the, the gap between successful companies versus not is how they've converted that data Thank into insights. good actionable uh, work, whether it's integrating it into the product or insights for the business to run well. It's, it's that, that is the gap that, between success and non-successful. Yeah, right. fully, fully subscribe to what you just said. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is all the time we have. But thank you guys so much thank for you. being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.